Upstairs at Freilux, show 409, real one. Oh, I'm sorry. I think what I meant to say is quiet! All right, what are we doing here? We're doing Karate Kid. We're doing Cobra Kai. I want to. I figure we talk about the movies a little bit too, because the movies are like probably the one thing that really. I don't know about your. You're a little bit younger than me, but the movies were the thing that really connected my generation and probably got these people got us off our asses. To watch All right. Cobra so Kai. for context, I will just tell you one thing, and I've told you this many times, but for the listening audience, the fondest memories I have of the Karate Kid, specifically the Karate Kid Part 2, is sitting in my room in 1988 with a 13-inch wood grain pull knob twist dial TV with a Nintendo in one corner and a Betamax VCR in the other corner with my recorded off of HBO copy of the Karate Kid Part 2. Mm -hmm. And believe me when I tell you, I wore the ever-loving shit out of that tape. Was it a color TV or a black and white TV? It was a color TV. Oh. It was a little color TV. It was just a cheap little early, late 70s, early 80s, you know, twist knob, twist knob TV. You know what I mean? It was one of them cheapies, but it got the job done. And Little Generation X bond. detail there. Only, uh, I believe, 12-inch TVs were black and white. 13-inch TVs were color. And I had a 13-inch Sylvania, I believe. <laughs> and uh, Well, Sylvania was in the in the 80s. Like, Sylvania was a decent brand before they started uh, going just light bulb manufacturing only. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because Sylvania it, was actually a pretty decent brand. They were a decent brand. I um I but we it was like our replacement TV every time the RCA 19 inch color TV uh, conked out because back then you could actually get your TV repaired and it didn't cost you yeah an arm cause and the because the tubes the, yeah the tubes because the TV itself cost that. a lot of money back that RCA 19 inch that my mom bought was like nine hundred dollars and she bought it in seventy nine oh, yeah. I think I was really stupid one time I had a I had a glass of chocolate milk. And no. it, it spilled, and it and, and, and it went back uh, into the tubes in the back or through the vent, and that thing was out of commission for a few months because I mean, because it cost about one hundred and fifty dollars, and that was a lot back then to repair it. So we subsisted off of the Sylvania thirteen inch for a little while. Um, eventually, televisions got really cheap in the nineties. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, well, things you know, co chip costs go down, manufacturing costs go down. I mean, tell that was the thing about TVs, man. They were expensive for a while. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it took years for TVs to come down. Yeah. But compared to the '80s and the '50s, yeah, TVs were way cheaper in the '80s than they were the '50s. But then you take another, you remove another thirty years from the equation. Yeah, TVs were hella cheap back in like. 2010. See, now this, okay, this conversation is something that Gen Xers will enjoy because we are talking about Cobra Kai and that whole, the whole thing. I mean, like my wife took five minutes to look at the TV show and she was like, this is like a, this is like bridging the gap between Generation X and Generation Z, isn't it? And I'm like, yes, you got it. You understand. That's mainly what the, what the show is. But like I said, it's based on the Karate Kid, which is, <laughs> it's a different. Okay, I started well, I started a series at the beginning of the year called Franchise Rewind, and uh, one of the movies I cover is Karate Kid. And my my first review of Karate Kid showed up in Second Union in April, uh, earlier this year. I watched all the Karate Kid movies again, except the only one I hadn't seen was. Um, the new one with... Uh, Next Karate Kid. Oh, Jaden Smith. Yeah, the one with Jaden Smith, the one that Will Smith produced. Apparently, Will Smith is now like a big producer of this Karate Kid franchise, I, I guess. Yeah, uh, in in name only. In him name and his, uh, like, his uh, brother-in-law are, are producing, right? Right. Well, just know this. Even though Will Smith's name is on this, on Cobra Kai, he pretty much has nothing to do with it. He must... Okay... He must be a rights holder. He must have uh, some ownership. It's, of the yeah, rights. it's a it's a rights holder thing. It's a production. Did company. he buy? It's something I guess like that. He must have bought the rights in order to do his remake with Jackie Chan and his kid, right? Somewhere around there, but then again, they were all done with the same studio. <coughs> yeah, like yeah, even so the remake Canada. was done at the same studio. Columbia, Columbia. So, Picture but Sony. his, yeah, his. I guess it was a deal with his production company, and then his production company works on Cobra Kai, and then because it's his production company. He gets listed as an executive producer. He's getting a paycheck. Well, it's like okay, like it's a definite the paycheck. Better, the better example for it, okay. And I again, I hate going off tangent. I'm just going to use this as an example. Argo, the movie from 2012. Ben Affleck Brad movie. Pitt's yeah, Ben Affleck Argo. Brad Pitt's production company had a hand in getting that movie made, and he was listed as a producer, but he did not get up on stage to accept an Oscar. So it's like. I think his producer role was pretty backseat 
You know what Clooney, I mean? Clooney was involved. It in was Clooney, too, Grant Heslov, and Ben Affleck who got the Oscars for Best Picture that year. Right, right. Uh, and Clooney. the only reason I know who Grant Heslov is is because of uh, True Lies, one of my all-time Oh, Grant Heslov movies. is in a bunch of, but he was like, he was always the comic relief in action movies, you know? Mm, yeah. And then for some it. reason he retired, and then he formed a partnership with George Clooney. And didn't George Clooney also have a partnership with Steven Soderbergh too, right? Oh, yeah. I, mean, I forgot the name always... of the company, though. Damn it. It's the one that worked on Ocean's Eleven. Like, uh, in my review, I know I noted that the Karate Kid is my generation's uh, Rocky. And it's a different kind of Rocky because this is an 80s movie. And in 80s movies, you have to win because that's just the way it was. It was the me generation. Rocky, the first Rocky movie, uh, he loses. He loses the fight, but he learned something. And the thing is, it, it was a 70s trope that he, winners didn't always win. So you, you had a learning experience when you were losing. And John Avison directed Rocky, and he directed The Karate Kid. But mm -hmm. Stallone decided to direct for the rest of the series until Rocky V. I don't, uh, he just, uh, maybe he thought he could do it better. I don't know. I don't think he did. Frankly, well, I think Rocky so is Stallone the best one of them all. Always, he said he always wanted to do this, that, and everything else in Hollywood. And Rocky literally opened up a bunch of fucking doors for him, so... Yeah, but that was the movie that but, got all the notice and got all the awards because it was an incredible piece of filmmaking. It was made for no, for less than a million dollars, the budget, because nobody was all unknowns in it. And even uh, I mean, John Avison was actually more famous than Rocky. He was already nominated for a couple of Oscars before Rocky even came out. So save the you know, I think save the tiger. Save the tiger, yeah, the big, that, Jack, that was a big one. Yeah, for Jack, Jack Lemmon. Lemmon. Well, the thing with Rocky also, uh, he even said Rocky just didn't want to win. He just wanted to go with all fifteen rounds. Just want to go well, to this. He distance. just says nobody's ever gone the distance with Creed. Nobody's ever, you know, lasted a full 15 rounds. He goes, win or lose, if I go all 15 rounds, I know I'm a good fighter. I don't give a shit at that point. That's that was his idea of winning, and this was a movie made in '76. But then, you know, Rocky II comes out in '79, which is like right, and it also plays this weird time traveling trick that they do in Karate Kid too, as well, where I don't know somebody ages 10 years in like five months. People but all aged those movies and so all those movies he back wins. then. You know that, right? People age so differently. They did, but it didn't make any sense because when you think about it, and I wrote this in all my Rocky reviews too, Rocky II takes place five seconds after Rocky I, but takes place three years of what was made three years later. Rocky III takes place right after Rocky II, which means that 1980, 1982 actually um, lasted six years. And then it, it, we play this game with the Karate Kid because in the Karate Kid, Karate Kid Two ends five seconds after Karate Kid won, then Daniel goes off on his little trip to Jip, to Okinawa with um, with Mr. Miyagi well, while, let's, uh, let's, while let's Karate Kid... Out. Hang on, let's wait. time out on that real quick. You go forgot ahead. about the six-month the six month point. The six-month point, he is away in Okinawa. And as oh, he's no, no, away no, no, in no, no, Okinawa, no, no. Martin Cove is coming back for Karate Kid 3. So Martin Cove is, is dealing with the fallout of Cobra Kai while... Daniel's son and Miyagi are in Okinawa. Right, so remember how they showed so them leaving for the airport? It. it showed them leaving for the airport at the beginning of Karate Kid Three while Martin Cove was going into the Cobra Kai gym and meeting up with Terry Silver. Remember? Oh boy, man, I gotta correct a lot of things you just said. You can see it. <laughs> you see it right in okay, Karate Kid Three. You see them gonna, going to the airport start. while Martin Cove is going right. to Cobra Kai. All right, we're gonna we're gonna start right. We're gonna start right over. So number one. You are correct when you say that at the end of Karate Kid, or at the beginning of Karate Kid 2, yes, certain scene takes place right at the beginning, right after the tournament. That's where Miyagi That's where, uh, basic, where... base, basically beats up uh, Kreese. Yeah, for strangling you know, Johnny for, Lawrence. He tried, for to, strangling Johnny. He tried to kill you Johnny Lawrence. You forgot about that, and then you forget right after that, there's a title card that comes up six months later. Oh, I must have missed that, sorry. You missed <laughs> that little title card. So but Karate six months, Kid okay, two, still six months. Right. So it takes Karate Kid 2. That's that's half place, of Breaking Bad right there. Six months. <laughs> <laughs> takes place in the summer of 1985. So even, you know, because uh, Karate Kid takes place in December of 1984. Karate Kid 2 takes place in the summer of 1985. So the Karate Kid 3 Karate exists Kid... in a no man's land because it's What's the same that? time period. It's uh, Karate Kid 3 exists in a no man's land where it's now, the same the time part, period. The part that you were talking about. Yes. While. Daniel and Miyagi are in Okinawa. Crease and Silver are getting together, this and that. Now, there's not a scene where Daniel and Miyagi are going to the airport. They're coming back from the airport. They just yeah. had arrived. They were leaving the airport, and Terry Silver was dropping off John Crease. And John Crease goes to go into to Cobra Tahiti, Kai. To go to Tahiti. He can't pay his bills. It's unpopular now because of the All Valley thing and what happened. And 
his techniques and then kind of like a precursor of Cobra Kai in a way. Uh, Terry Silver comes back. He's like a rich benefactor now. And I, I, I got a little confused. I always get confused with this because sometimes it seems like Terry Silver is the rich benefactor slash mentor and then Kreese is the mentor. I'm not really sure sometimes. It seems as though I'm going to assume um, that, that Terry Silver is just your rich friend who can hook you up. And he's but the rich, thing is, he's rich, they said rich that Uncle he financed eggs. it. Yeah, yeah, rich, rich Uncle Skeleton, I like to call him. But yeah, Rich Uncle Skeleton, and he is kind of a skeleton on Cobra Kai. Jesus. Anyway, uh, uh, he, I guess he, it is technically his dojo then, and he just Chris just teaches in it, right? You know, pretty much, yeah. It always has alluded to the fact that basically John Chris started Cobra Kai with Terry Silver as a backer, but That's using, I guess, That's using come... Terry's money though. Well, not really. He's he never did misuse the money because you got to figure. John Kreese, okay, they never specifically say when the Cobra Kai dojo was started. There is never a time, there is never, like, a time period of when they said the dojo was no, started. No, we don't get, what yeah, you, we, don't, we don't get any You don't that. know that. What you do know is that in Writers season Writers weren't as anal back then. <laughs> yeah. In season five, spoiler alert, guys, this is a spoiler podcast in case anybody hasn't been You should probably attention. watch it because it was, we are like less spoilers. than a month ago, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but then, you know, it's, when it's TV and when you're a month fucking removed, who cares? Um, well, you said, you, wait, wait, before you start, you said that you just binged the whole fucking thing, right? Is that what you said? I watched it twice, dude. But you watched season it, like, five, straight I through, right? I watched it twice. I loved season five. You know, the um, last couple of episodes there are a little bit longer than normal running time. But, um, well, season four is the one that has them two long ass episodes: the uh, the fall and the rise. The last two episodes of season four, they the, literally um, well, no, they I, swung um, for defenses on I think season four. They really swung the for final defenses. the the last two episodes of this season. One was forty five minutes, and the other one was like forty fifty minutes or something like that. I'm not sure. It, it, it's they they had a lot to. Write. I guess that's kind of weird. They could have just added episode order. But instead, they did this thing that Stranger Things does now, which is make these feature-length films, practically. Well, okay, episode. season five, on the other hand, I was going to say, the second-to-last episode's probably, like, the second longest. It probably goes for, like, 35, anywhere between 35 and 40 minutes. But then is that the, the one finale where they have, goes they, for, like, in 45 the, um, minutes. <clears throat> they're in the stretched um, Hummer, and uh, the, the car's driving out of control, and it turns out to be Barnes. Sorry about the spoiler. <laughs> that was great. I didn't, that, dude, that I, came out of fucking nowhere. That actually, you know great. what's funny about that that actor, the actor who plays Barnes? Sean, Can Sean Kanan. Sean Kanan, right. He's 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 kind of funny. He's got he like is. A, he's got like a funny thing that – it's the thing that um, that William Zabka was, was doing when he was mm -hmm. playing Johnny Lawrence, kind of like this kind of clueless, airheaded kind of funny thing about him. Aloof. <laughs> I guess a little, maybe Gen X aloof, 80s aloof, whatever it is. Uh, that was like a cliffhanger thing. That was almost like one of those old school, uh, what what's uh, uh, what were they called? Serial. Like a serial. serial, yeah. It's like the car's out of control. At first, I didn't even think anybody was driving. I just thought, I thought somebody, I thought we were going to cut, <laughs> I thought we were going to cut to silver with a remote control, sneering and grinning and going, ah! <laughs> Like okay, that. that's a, that. Okay, I'm sorry to say that's a little 280s for me. No thanks. <laughs> that's a little 280s. Even I mean, a guy. It's gonna be like when this baby hits 80s. 88, you're gonna see some serious shit. Hey, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, the point well, I was getting back to real quick, though. We're talking about Karate Kid to. two three, the Karate Kid two three time traveling thing. Yeah. You find out again in season five that in around 1980 was when Silver and Terry were still training under Kim Sung Young. And that's where uh, John had already had his uh, his dojo up and running, and he was literally alluding to John Lawrence was his you know top student. So and Johnny Lawrence was with him for from like seventy nine, right? Yeah, seventy eight, seventy nine, all the way up until eighty four. So he was with him for a good you know five years. But then, okay, you get this kind of Revenge of the Sith thing in Karate Kid three, where uh, Terry Silver is training uh, Daniel. Um, because I, he has, he, he arranges for like Chris to like, quote unquote, die. He said he died, sent him yeah. off someplace for a holiday or something. Right. And then he becomes, he becomes the emperor or something like that. And the thing is, I was making these comparisons way back in April when I was writing these karate kid reviews up and I, no one, okay, this is, this is something that I, I looked at a bunch of reviews of the show and I watched a bunch of stuff on YouTube. No one has really made this comparison. Karate kid is basically star Wars. The, the structure of the whole thing is Star Wars. But 
it owes a lot to Rocky as well because of John Avildsen and all that stuff. Bill of Conti course. doing the music. Everything comes together. John G. Avildsen, um, I said, I, I wrote my review. I think because because Stallone was such a talented guy, he also had a very big ego, and it was, I guess, hard for Avildsen. And so Avildsen wanted to have a franchise or something that he can control himself. So he directed all three of the movies. And what's really great about the Karate Kid movies is. Um, even as they became less popular in the late 80s, we go into 89. 89, um, both Karate Kid 1 and 2 were both big, enormous hits. And very, very little in terms of uh, budget, too. I mean, the budgets did not really get out of control, which is very no, interesting. Well, John Avildsen knew how to keep a budget in line. That was a good thing about him. He was just an official. Dude, he Remember was Rocky IV? Rocky IV's old, budget was like $40 million. Dollars. He was an old school canon guy. Like this is the ca- the That's canon right. before uh, Manaha. Yeah, my name is Joe. Before, or call me Joe. Yeah, or what my is it? Well, Joe, just Joe. Joe. It's just Joe. Joe. Sorry, Peter Boyle. Yeah, this was the ca- this was the canon before Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus took over. This is when this the was canon total. Was just like this, this was back when they were political and exploitative and all that stuff. But this was a guy who knew how to keep a budget under control. You know, he didn't go over. And he budget. did. I think, dude. Again, like you just Karate said, Kid shot Two Rocky was only like two million dollars, dollars right? He Karate shot Kid Rocky was only, for a million. Yeah, it was less than a million, but then Rocky Two gets really expensive. Rocky Three, Rocky Four, forty million dollars. You know, spending all that money because it, it, Stallone was kind of cashing in on his superstar status. Okay, well now he here's like here's the other question I have for you. Now this could maybe explain a couple of things. Okay, mm-hmm. I don't want to get too far off. So we all know this that 1979 United Artists was owned by Transamerica at the time. Were at they the owned time, by yeah. Transamerica in 1976? No, no. The purchase, so, I the purchase of Trans, uh, the purchase of United Artists was in oh 78. I want to say. Okay, so there's your explanation right there. So when the original Rocky was being done at United Artists, that was still a good, you know a decent company that didn't was, have like yeah. you know the bottomless checkbook you know they didn't I have mean? paramount money they didn't, they didn't have, have that 80s money, right. cocaine money you know <laughs> i thought as soon as transamerica bought them then they had that freaking you know that that cocaine money right there they had that big money that i'm not michael, even i'm not even michael joking you know heaven's gate money right there yeah, that was their Transamerica money. That was part. It made okay. The thing is, that deal made them all multimillionaires. All the executives who ran UA, and it took money out of what was really needed because they decided to get all eighties about it and just let's put all our money in this big thing instead of doing what they used to do, which was like a little bit here, a little bit there. We can diversify. We can make all these movies. I I wasn't joking when I said cocaine money because Robert Evans ran Paramount for some time, and I I've always suspected that he did a lot of money laundering through drugs. He Robert Evans was kind of a drug dealer back then and he used to sell cocaine. And he even that even resulted I think in the death of somebody during when they were making the Cotton Club. It had to do with these drug dealer friends of his and they killed this guy who was like an impresario, who was a producer in musicals and stuff. I think his name was Robert Raiden, I'm not sure. No, Roy Raiden, something like that. He died, they killed him, and, and it was all it all had to do with drugs. And these people were just, ooh. Yeah, I'd, love to, well, I'd love to write a script about that. I'd love to write, write a script about the, the drug trade in movie studios back in the 80s. That, that's a good idea. I think you should write that down. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> so Thank you Mr. Fair. For, that's a good idea for a band, dude. I think you should write that down. You should totally write that down. <laughs> Call themselves the Lone Rangers. How do you pluralize Rangers? You're not exactly lone, are you? Shouldn't you be the Three Rangers? But yeah, I mean. So okay, Karate Kid Three. Uh, that now you want to talk now that you want to get better illusion. You want to talk about getting coked out? That's fucking uh, Ralph Macchio on fucking speed and coke and everything else. And on on top of that, he's pledgy. What well, he was already getting into his thirties at that time, right? He was twenty eight around. The, he was like either twenty seven or twenty. No, wait, he just turned right. sixty this year. He just turned 60 this year, so he was 26 during so, the time yeah. of production. And he was, okay, you know, in my review, I had no idea about this, but in my review of Karate Kid 3, I was like, why does Robin Lively put him immediately in the friend zone? And then I read up that she was, like, underage at the time. She was, 16. Yeah, she, was she was 16, 17. On top of that, her character had a boyfriend. Yeah, but, but it was set up. Karate Kid 3 was set up that she would ditch the boyfriend and wind up with Ralph Macho, but then... You can sense halfway through the movie there are these last minute rewrites that say, "Oh, wait a minute, we're just friends." Well, also at the same time, wasn't there? And you a know, I mean, every on. single wasn't time he gets a girlfriend, strike? right? Wasn't there a writer strike going on around that time? What eighty nine? Eighty eight, uh, eighty nine. There was a writer strike. Yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah. So, 
I think that might explain a few things. Robert Mark came in, of course. He wrote the screenplays for the first three. Um, there was probably a writer's strike, and he probably turned his script in at the zero hour. And while the strike was going on, he couldn't be on set. He couldn't make tweaks. They had to film it as written. I wanted to I bring mean, up Mike, don't, Robert don't, don't Mark Don't get me wrong in. about part three. It is out of the original trilogy. It is the weakest film, but Thomas It's e. the Griffith, weakest, but... but. I was going to say this. I totally forgot. Even in going into the next Karate Kid, I really enjoyed all these movies. I thought they were a lot of fun. They weren't quite as good as the first one, but nothing ever is. Karate I'm in Kid that part rare two. camp who likes the, who likes part two more than part one. I, you know, I, I, kind I of, got the t- dude. It's bi- it's a biased opinion. I'm not gonna. Dude, it's, it's a like little I, how I love Ford Fairlane. You know, it's a biased opinion. You know what's interesting? They did the the. They did not shoot in Japan. They shot in Hawaii and made Okinawa look like... Oh, yeah, because you couldn't like... shoot in real Okinawa, so they just shot but in Hawaii. I knew that. This looks like actual Okinawa and Cobra Kai, though. I think they might have actually gone to Okinawa and actually shot there. I'll look it they up. They might have. I it looks different. You can tell about it because of the climate. You can tell because of the way it looks when it's being photographed. It's a little disappointing, though, because the whole thing, the Okinawa was turned into a fucking walking mall. With a fucking red lobster and uh, well, because whatever every, else. dude, everything gets westernized, man. That's how it is these days. Except for like Chosen has like his, he still has his little dojo and he has his, you know, nice uh, locale that he likes to uh, teach from. You know, we get into that. It's okay. Well, first, let's talk about the next Karate Kid. I that's another one I really did enjoy, but it's a different approach because. It's almost because like, Ralph Macchio was too fucking old and he didn't want to do it anymore. Well, he, he was, been, he was, he yeah, he was too old. It's okay. Then, I didn't mind it. I didn't mind that. Of course he had to go. Cause yeah, he was turning into an old man by that point. He was getting ready to collect social security out of high school. But in this one, yeah. Hillary Swank is plays this kid who has this anger management problem. She's a very angry woman and they don't, you know, I mean, they don't really like do what they do now with women these days, which is empower them and make them even angrier. Instead, Miyagi is kind of like uh, her professor, Henry Higgins, from My Fair Lady. He teaches her to be a lady. <laughs> it's like a weird... He even buys her a dress for the dance, which is so... I thought it was adorable. I thought, And Hilary Swank is just absolutely adorable. She's delicious in the movie. You could eat her up. And and she's she's... This might have been her first and maybe most embarrassing part. I really hope that she will come back for cover. She said... I read some reviews, uh, articles that said nobody's given her. A nobody's, call. nobody said. But you know what? They I probably think, think she thinks she's too good for it. But I think she's, I think she's a good sport, and I think she'll show up like Elizabeth Shue did. I think it's a big cover story. I think you they think it's gonna. Are, oh, they, like what they that, did with Picard, where they said nobody was gonna come back. Now everybody's coming back. So I want to make one point right here and now. I want to tell tell my funny thing about this and what I think is hilarious. So mm. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. <clears throat> but you are aware that the guys who did all three Harold and Kumar movies are responsible for Cobra Kai, right? You mean those, uh, what, Schlossberg and Hurwitz? Yes. Those, guys? those are the guys that are responsible for the Harold and Kumar franchise. Okay. I saw I saw the first one. And they, they, go to White oh, Castle, and right? they also did American Reunion, the uh, fourth American Pie movie, because wow. the original writer, he didn't want to come back. And I actually love American Reunion. I think it's hilarious. The weirdest thing about Cobra Kai and this pretty much summarizes it for me. I cannot believe how much attention these guys have paid to the franchise and have done so much to like not tarnish the legacy of those three movies and have been so, so careful with like making sure not to contradict themselves, not to cause. Yeah. They're very good with continuity or anything like that. Now, what I find hilarious about this is You have these great filmmakers out there who pay little to no attention to detail, and then you've got these three guys who are responsible for some dumbass comedies, and they do better reboots than most real fucking studios out there. This is the one consistency I've I've seen in every review and every video about Cobra Kai is that this is a franchise from the 80s that has returned that does not is not horrible and does not insult its audience. I mean, and these people are not insulting their audience because they don't have to because the audience is with them. The audience likes this stuff. When, you, when you're when you doing shit like Rings of Power and you're fucking calling half of your audience evil because they don't like your your show, that is like the worst thing you could ever do. You are just going to piss people off more and more. Uh, what's another one? Fucking Star Wars. Fucking, uh, you know, Ryan Johnson and J.J. And J. Abrams totally destroying that franchise a disney kathleen kennedy destroying it on tv 
And then um, what else? I mean, these are these are like okay member berries from South Park, but these are good member berries. They're actually that it's definitely within the spirit of the movie. It's a little bit. It gets a little. It's a little randy with the language, though. I mean, they they actually let loose oh, with the f word a couple of times. This last season, shit, dude! All the f bombs they dropped this last season. It's weird to hear. It's weird to hear Ralph Macchio curse. I frankly. know. You're out of your fucking mind. <laughs> I mean, like, it's like I'm like I did not ever expect to hear that come out of his fucking mouth. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind, and, and also all the shit about pussies and nerds and pussies. <laughs> they well, even, I, I mean, expect that out of Johnny, though. I expect that. Out honest of Johnny. trailers did a very funny honest trailer where they said every other word out of his mouth was pussy or nerd. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the first and second season though that's when I, I i really i really dug the way the show started off because it was more it was more about him than it was about ralph Mach ralph machi almost felt like um you know halfway the first half of the first season he was almost like a special guest star he was just sort of popping up but then he gets involved i, I kind of liked it when it was more focused on johnny well i mean but it still does have a big focus on johnny though because like Yes, the whole thing was started from Johnny's point of view, and Maybe I guess his, is, his evolution. Yes, yeah, his evolution. This is what this is the big problem I had with season two, though, is like while I do enjoy season two on the whole, don't get me wrong, too much focus on the kids, not enough focus on the adults. That's my issue. That, with but two. that's a big problem with every show now because it seems like every show just adds on all of these characters, and then it gets too big to handle, especially well, then, since then, you're dealing with a mainly three. a show that's like a half an hour long with only ten episodes. Per season. Come season three, they righted the ship, though. Like, season three, they got everything right. Like, they they balanced it out perfectly. Like, they heard the complaints. Like, hey, look, we understand. We spent too much time on the kids in the last season. We'll focus more on Johnny and Daniel this season. And they did, you know. Season four, oh, wanted... though, is like, season four is still my dark horse. It's like, I like season four. Don't get me wrong. It's just too woke. The last two episodes are too fucking long. And... It literally is just nothing but fucking build up. But then season five, like it did before, it, it writes the ship. Like season five, people were talking about, oh yeah, season five. Season really five gets a little bit over the top. There are there are a couple of over the top fight sequences that happen. The first big one, of course, is uh, the one in the high school that results in Miguel getting paralyzed. Well, for l l let me tell you, I just want to bring up something about. Uh, this all came from an autobiographical story from Robert Mark Kamen because he was studying karate. I wanted to ask you first, did you ever study karate or anything like that? No, I was just a big martial arts movie nut. I did. I took a year of kung fu uh, because my mother took some kung fu for self-defense back then. She was a single mom back in the 80s, and she she um, she studied kung fu. The kung fu is, is different than karate because it's a lot less physical. It's just mainly to kill you know, it's sort right. of like dangerous, but I only took like a year of it because my grades weren't going so well, but we don't talk about that. And mm -hmm. I was almost about to get thrown out of school. But uh, I, I, there was a very old uh, master that we had. We didn't really call them senseis in Kung Fu, but he was like this really old man. And he shook my hand and he nearly broke the, every bone in my hand with this one <laughs> handshake. This guy was about 90 years old. And I was like, shit. I did learn a couple of basic things. There wasn't any kind of competition or going on because this was like Eastern Kung Fu, which is not really taught here. Western Kung Fu is like very similar to what you see in, in the Karate Kid, that kind of stuff, you know, a lot of the rhythm and the dancing and, you know, do the beat of the rhythm of the night, dance until the morning light. I wanted to ask why Robert Mark Heyman doesn't have any involvement in this TV show because he still works, They, but for some reason the Wikipedia has him retiring because he took his first check for his first screenplay, and he invested it in a vineyard, and he started selling grapes to wine to winemakers. Uh, but he was still working. I mean, he's working as 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 most recently as 2019. Angel has fallen. Well, you also have to remember he had this. Uh, my French. Sucked. Also, I just wanted to point out every every story every movie that he's written i've seen and they're all some of these are fantastic. Well, I, like, that's where I was going to allude to next. Now, again, my French sucks because I took Spanish. Mm. But um, he had a very long-lasting relationship with Luc Besson. Luc Besson, he did the uh, Taken movies. He wrote them with yeah, him. he and did the Transporter. Well, well, yeah, the, and well, the Fifth well, Element, also, he co-wrote it. The Taken was done from uh, Luc Besson's production company. Um, I'm trying to think if he, like, same with the Transporter movies. He did that in conjunction with Luc Besson, his uh, yeah. his company. Apparently, Luc um, Besson is a as a fan of his, I guess. Well, they but I mean, look at what he wrote, though. He wrote he wrote uh, the Punisher, the original with Dolph Lundgren, which is awesome. Uh, he wrote Gladiator, uh, Rowdy Harrington's Gladiator, yeah, which Rowdy is Harrington's one of my favorites. Gladiator. I love that film. Oh, Cooper by the way, if you you might have I don't know if you have it, but there's a Blu-ray of Gladiator that is gorgeous. I have a DVD. At. I have a DVD because 
when I first saw it, I saw it on VHS. It looked like crap. And then I saw I, they must have restored it like crazy for Blu-ray because it is beautiful looking now. And he wrote The Power of One with uh, that was that was directed by John Avison, right? Yeah, Power of One. And he that. also wrote Lethal Weapon 3 for some reason. And he wrote Under Siege. He did an uncredited rewrite on Under yep. Siege and The Fugitive. I guess he worked for Andrew, Andy Davis. But that's where his association with The Karate Kid ended because he only did the first three movies. Yeah, because um, by the time the fourth one rolled around, he wasn't interested. Like, I, dude, I, I guarantee you, Sony was Sony at the time, so I can legitimately say Sony. Sony probably came up to him, gave him gave him a money offer, and said, "Hey, you know, we're gonna do this low budget one. You want to write?" He's like, "Like, I'm done." But he ended up but, writing a lot but of then, good shit, though. I like half the. Well, dude, you're talking about Cobra Kai, right? Uh, that they. Do you think well, they no, Cobra did? Kai was he had nothing to do with it. I'm talking about the next Karate Kid. Like they probably oh, okay. approached him with a shitload of money and said, "Hey, do you so want to write So do you think I mean at least no. he has? There's nothing here. There's not. He says nothing about Cobra Kai. He he doesn't. You know, and that's something I think you really need. And I guarantee you, want, you he want gets his to blessing. sit back and collect a nice fucking paycheck from it, though. Well, maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe he's like that other guy. Who's that guy who uh, who produced uh, Buffy? Joss uh, Whedon. No, no, no. The guy who produced oh, the movie. Oh, uh, Fran Kazooie. Fran Kazooie, right? Okay, he gets an executive producer credit on the TV show, and he doesn't work on it. Yeah. Which means he gets a paycheck. That must have been part of a deal that he had with Fox. Just like Will Smith. It's like if you ever make a show of this, credit, I get. But doesn't, but doesn't do damn thing. It's paid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this guy. I mean, these are just money people, really. In the end, but but, Cayman is a writer, and it seems like you want his blessing on this. Well, he did. I mean, especially I guess since it's... they didn't. They did not embarrass him. They did not destroy the work, and they didn't antagonize the fans. They actually did something that was really good. My only complaint about Cobra Kai is just kind of the silly, the product placement. That's all. I mean, yeah, like, all the stuff, but it's, I it's almost, Sony. I, it's fucking Sony. What can I just say, I almost went out and bought Uncrustables because of one <laughs> fucking scene. I almost went and bought. Oh wow! I like, did you eat the jelly. last Uncrustable? I was almost about to buy one. I I never. I don't drink Coors Banquet. I Coors Banquet tastes like shit to me. I it like does. Coors Light. I like the Silver Bullet. I don't like Coors Banquet. I don't eat. I, my oh my and old, Kettle uh, Martinis. Kettle is a very expensive brand. I don't go buying Kettle either. I don't. I'm not no. into that. <laughs> my old college roommate tried getting me into Coors Banquet back in like uh, 03. And I was like, you know what, dude? I'd rather, I'd much rather drink Coors Light. I cannot do Coors Banquet. It's yeah, too Coors heavy. Light, it's way yeah. too heavy. I think Coors Banquet is like the, I don't know, the redneck Heineken or something. <laughs> it's like a Heineken for rednecks, or or you know, white trash or whatever that is. But I, I also, uh, you, you have to drink every time a flat screen TV is destroyed on this show. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> uh, you see them going all the time. I mean, I was sitting there watching, finishing up one episode. Regan's in the room, and I'm like, "There goes another flat screen," and she's like, "What?" And I said, "I do a count of every flat screen that's killed on this TV <laughs> in this TV show." Now, I guess the better question is, since you have a teenage daughter, has she uh, delved into this show at all? Uh, no, not yet. I am going to show, th this is another one of my in-between shows that I watch, because right now we're finishing up Breaking Bad, and we're probably going to start Better Call Saul next week, but, okay. um, these are my in-between shows that I watch, like Walking Dead, Game of Thrones, I'm going to eventually get to all of them with the family, if I live that long, God knows. Um, she does know about Karate Kid, we showed her Karate Kid, you know, it's like, Karate Kid is so, it's... It's such a great movie, I, and it's like a movie that really, oh my god, it makes me want to cry thinking about it because there was a lot of my memories as a kid. Uh, uh, what did I? Are attached what to did that I film. just tell you, man? That that's like. I mean, I, I felt th like I think you and I are the people that that show set out to impress the most: the diehards, the people who know everything about the mythology, the ones it's who very, were just there. You know, I I don't even mind being cheesy about this. It's very kind of important to me because it's like it's there's like a touchstone where you can remember you remember where you were when you saw the movie and you remember uh, I, I remember what day it where was. I was I, I know had, I, I know when I saw it I saw it uh, the first time I saw it in Philadelphia in 1985 on HBO we didn't get around to seeing it, I guess because we were moving up uh, we were moving from Tennessee back up to Philadelphia and my mother shelled out thirty dollars a month for a fucking satellite to put on the roof so that we could continue to have our HBO and uh, it was really not the greatest reception, but still, we watched it, and we watched, you know, Karate Kid is like, it is, Rocky was to the Baby Boomers what Karate Kid is to us, just the same as Dr. Strangelove was to the Baby Boomers what War Games was to us. We had yes. our own, we had our own kind of storytelling, and it was for our generation, 
And the thing, you know, Ralph Macchio is kind of he's an icon of the '80s because of The Outsiders. He was Johnny, mm -hmm. and you know, Stay Gold, Pony Boy, and all that stuff. And 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 my wife and my daughter have been reading the S.E. Hinton books, so she, you know, Johnny was like one of her favorite characters, and she she wept when he died at the end of The Outsiders. I mean, it's just you know, and also and he also gets to stretch a little bit into the '90s because of my cousin Vinny, which is like he's not even. He's not even in the marketing or advertising He's for not. my cousin Vinny. It's all Joe Pesci and a little Marissa Tomei. And I'm watching the movie and I'm like, holy shit, that's, that's fucking but Danny you, LaRusso. You also forgot about the other movie, though. The one movie that nobody wait, wait, fucking wait. talks about. Don't ruin it for me. Hang on, hang on. Let me see if I can remember what Remember, movie. no keyboards, no nothing. I want you to use your brain. 1986, directed by Walter Hill. Oh, come on. Walter Hill, 1986. Uh, Music see. by Joe Santriani on guitar. Uh, Walter five, Hill, Five. Four, three. Wait, give me a co-star. Give me a co-star. Jamie Gertz. Oh, oh, oh! God, uh, was it? Uh, um, 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 uh, oh, Jamie Gertz. God damn it! That doesn't help. Time is up. The movie is Crossroads. Oh fuck me! I totally forgot about that movie. Why didn't you mention guitars? You should have said did. guitars. I said Joe Santriani on fucking guitar. Yeah, but I don't know anything. I did. Joe Santriani said he's a musician. Yeah, no, a deal with the, the devil. You should have said a deal with the devil. Work. He did all the fucking guitar work for that movie, man. I totally forgot that Jamie Gertz was in that movie. You should have said deal with the devil. I, I should have said deal. Robert Johnson, deal with the devil. Fucking crossroads. Fucking Eric ass, Clapton. Man. You could have said, you know, or you oh. could have gone. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> you could have done something. Yeah, I totally forgot about crossroads. So that's that's a movie that really um developed a cult audience and wasn't really popular though it was not popular on release but it got a fucking big cult audience i'm dude i can movie came out when i was four i didn't see it until i was way late in life but fuck does that movie kick ass that is one of the most underrated walter hill movies ever made that movie is up there with streets of fire as under fucking rated okay yeah yeah I Walter Hill in the '80s, which was, was awesome. Uh, I wanted to mention also that uh, that that William Zabka was also in a movie that is very held in high esteem in this house. He was in Just One of the Guys. Just one playing, of the guys. He was and... playing a bully too. He was playing kind of a bully in that movie. He always like, played the bully. Back to school, man. He was in Back to School. That's right. Yeah. He just has that look about him. You know, I I really like. Okay, this is part of this kind of revisionism that we have now, where we take a character that is originally considered to be evil or bad, and then we rewrite him to be kind of a good guy. And this this happens, and, and it happens very much in Cobra Kai, which is why really I. Actually, I'll tell you this right now. The first season of the show is perfect. Yes. The first, first season, season for me is, is absolutely amazing. perfect because the focus is on Johnny Lawrence and the fact that he considers himself a loser because of that fight in All Valley, what it did to his reputation. He lost his girlfriend, of course. He lost everything. We sort of rewrite some motivations like we do with every character. We even do this with Crease on the show. We rewrite some of his motivation and make him a little bit sympathetic based on his experience in Vietnam. What let's, we have let's, with... uh, let's also say at the very end of season one when Crease shows up, that was like one of the single greatest what the fuck Holy shit, god damn it, where's the fucking Tylenol moments ever? I will well I'll tell I you. I did this. not see I that thought, coming. I did not see that coming. I did see it coming because I figured this show was going to pull out all the stops and it was gonna bring every character back. That's why we're waiting for Louis Swank. I mean, we know she's gonna show up eventually. They got Tamlin Tamita and Elizabeth Shue and Robin Lively all in this. Yeah, the they got when they got Robin buddies. Lively and I almost shit. I almost <laughs> shit when I saw her. I'm like, did, I mean, I'm like, Jessica motherfucking Walters, you got <laughs> her of all people back. And on top of that, she's the cousin to fuck your cousin, sister, whatever. She's related to to Amanda. And I'm like, holy shit. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. You have Johnny Lawrence. He's just basically kind of like a day laborer and uh, he loses jobs constantly. He does too much. drink. They never really they never really tell him that he's drinking too much, and I think he does drink too much. It's yeah, interesting. he does. <laughs> but nobody like, ever says nobody nobody ever says you're drinking too much, Johnny. You got to stop drinking. Why are, Why are you drinking? That's the only '80s thing that's kind of missing from this, is because in the '80s people took on a very lecturing tone about behavior. Yeah, like, a lot of people don't do drugs, man. Say shit. no to drugs, man. Hey, say no to drugs or you're a pussy, man. You know. <laughs> Yeah, but you also got to remember now, marijuana is legal in a lot of states, so there ain't no such thing as good PSA. Anymore. I don't even think we see any. Do we even see anybody smoking weed on the show? Yeah. It's just drinking uh, mainly, right? No. We see a lot of underage drinking, drinking, too. You yeah, see underage, underage drinking. drinking. 
You don't see um, anybody doing blow or nothing like that. Except, no, nobody's except, snorting coke. Except nobody's in season the... five when when uh, Mike Barnes has obviously done a few lines before he picks up everybody. <laughs> um, he's done a I... couple of lines, but no one says nothing. So he's like, okay, so so Johnny's living in the shadow of of, of this whole thing, and it, it, and what's interesting is that um, I, you know, it's weird to me. I maybe it's the same to you. Daniel uh, is not the most sympathetic character. He's kind of a dick. You know, he becomes like this car salesman and he uses his karate and his, you know, he's chopping, uh, you know, uh, the competition down or whatever. And he sort of, he traded in his um, status as a cult celebrity to become a car salesman, gets into the business with his wife, who is played by Sheldon's twin sister on Big Bang Theory. And he has two kids. Uh, he has the very precocious little boy there who was like really fat and short in the first seasons and then suddenly... He, he gets taller and thinner. Oh, yeah. They don't even use him at all. <laughs> oh, and his all. voice breaks, like, too, which is so season bizarre. Season three, he's not. He's only in one scene in season three, like one. Yeah, that must that have been it. like his growth spurt must have happened in season <laughs> three. Because he comes back and he's taller and, and skinnier and his voice broke. By the um, way, uh, since you're a big House fan, go back to season one of House with the uh, jazz musician. Amanda's in that one. Is she? Who is she in that? She's episode? the one who serves House the pap the judge papers to say you can't go within 100 feet of the patient. Oh, oh really? Wow. That's, yeah. That's, I, oh, that got me. I was just like, I was like, oh, shit. Okay, that's you. Awesome. Fucking great. That Jeez, was like her first role. That's practically a, a walk on there. <laughs> that was, she was only, I think she was only when she did that. She was only like in her 20s. Oh, no. She, yeah, she was in her late 20s when she well, did that Well, that was role. season one of House. That was 2004. That was season one, yeah. So she was in her late 20s when she did that. So back from then, that was 14 years. Jeez. Courtney, Hen Courtney Hengler, or Courtney Hen Hengler. Hengler with a bunch of Gs. Hengler with a bunch of Gs. I can never pronounce her last name right, but. That's where I said, Daniel, man, you got lucky, you son of a bitch. You got you a hot wife.